Let's get to the point. Homeless veterans in Stockton have been displaced across multiple counties after the home that they were living in was shut down because of terrible conditions. It's a story that we've covered on To The Point for weeks. And it even got the attention of Congressman Josh Harder, who called on another shelter to expand faster to house those vets. And tonight's main point, Kurt Rivera tells us about the negotiations happening to get the unhoused vets a new home. In February, 66-year-old Army veteran Elias Villalon Jr. got a notice that once again put his life in a tailspin. Everybody got notice, so you've got 24 hours to move out. Villalon was living with over 30 other homeless veterans at the nonprofit Dignity's Alcove in downtown Stockton. The paint has completely came off the wall. As we reported in February, the building was falling into disrepair. But for three and a half months, veterans like Villalon had nowhere else to go. No heater, no, or the water was leaking big time, the pipes, rats everywhere. Yeah, the habitat was unsafe. The city ordered the landlord to make repairs, but according to the Stockton Police Department, which oversees code enforcement, when an inspector went to check on progress Thursday, the doors were locked and no one was there. About a half a mile from Dignity's Alcove, this building behind me is in the works to be the new location, right on the edge of downtown Stockton. Definitely a roller coaster. Director Diana Weiss says she did all she could to keep Dignity's alcove open, but is moving on, negotiating a lease on a new East Hazelton Street location. 20 room facility um, will be able to provide the same wraparound services, case management, uh, rides to doctor's appointments, court appointments. For now, veterans from Dignity's Alcove are scattered in temporary housing, some in different counties. Others, like Elias Villalon, are bouncing from one hotel room to the next. But he has an application for permanent veterans housing in French camp. That's my last source to turn that in. It's, it'll be a green light for me to move in. And a GoFundMe page has raised more than $4,000 for Dignity's Alcove. Several council members have indicated that they are willing to provide another $50,000 in funding, but it must be approved by a council vote. And we are just hours away from more snowfall in the foothills and the Sierra. For some people, things are just downright dangerous seeing all of this snow. And this is what it looks like in Grass Valley as people continue to dig out. And just miles up the road in Nevada City, uh, we're hearing from one family that has been stuck inside their home for six days. And this is the view of the Heatherman's family home. We even tried to get to it today and we couldn't get anywhere close to it. And get this, the mom, Jennifer, she is four months pregnant. Very scared um, because pregnancy complications that can happen in the second trimester and they're usually um, pretty, pretty severe situations. I don't know where a medevac would land near here. And rescue teams have been hard at work in the snow. CHP says that they have already rescued and helped several people using their helicopter. And as the next storm moves in, thousands of people remain without power. PG&E says 10,000 people are without power in Nevada County alone. And then take a look at this. PG&E says they dropped 700 gallons of water on the side of a mountain to reduce avalanche risk so that their workers could have safe access to get the power back on. They say a lot of the outages in our area are due to tree damage. Crews are in from other towns just to help out some of these areas. And the second snow survey of the season, it happened today up in the Sierra. You could say we were above average. We sent our Brendan Minchef up to Highway 50 to Phillips Station to get the story. I'm up here in Phillips, California, where we just finished with the snow survey for the start of March. And I'll tell you what, we're actually getting some really good numbers, some good news out of here. 116 and a half inch snow depth, 41 and a half inches of snow water content. That's 177% of the average to date and 170% uh, of the April 1st average. This, uh, this snowpack rivals the 1982 to 1983, which is the largest snowpack on record. Uh, and statewide, we're 190% of average, so we're doing very well. Uh, we still would like to see the Northern Sierra doing a little bit better. The number's not quite as great up there uh, as they are in the Central and Southern Sierra, and especially as it relates to uh, Shasta and Oroville. We're not in a bad position as things stand. 
And I think we'll we'll take that <laughs> compared to where we have been over the last few years. In Phillips, California, Brendan Minchef for ABC10. All right, let's get to meteorologist Carly Gomez. Carly, how much snow is there actually? Yeah, because they take those big long poles and they stick it in the ground and that's how they're able to measure how much that snow depth is. Well, we're looking at 116 and a half inches there at Phillips Station and the snow water equivalent is 41 and a half inches of water. Now, the average precipitation, as Brendan mentioned, is 177% here for this date, March 3rd. We use the April 1st date, though, as kind of the end of the snowy season. Typically, when we start to get the most runoff at that point, and we usually don't see a lot of snow past April 1st, but we get a little bit more, but it's not enough to be really uh, something that's measurable at that point. So April 1st is what we use kind of at the end of the season. Statewide, there's 130 sensors. So statewide, we do have a snow water equivalent of 44.7 inches. And the state average, though, is 190%. Southern California, 206% of average, or excuse me, 209% of average for this time of year. But statewide, we are seeing 171% as a state whole here. Water equivalent again, 44.7 inches. All right, let's talk about the weather ahead. Prepare now for these weekend storms as they do arrive tomorrow morning around lunchtime, 11 a.m. or so. Strong wind gusts are going to accompany them with heavy snow and downpours for the valley and for the high Sierra spots. Low snow could be around 1,000 feet. Do expect uh, travel there to be very difficult for the Sierra. Right now we're seeing increasing cloud coverage over the area. We do have a winter storm warning in effect until 10 a.m. on Monday. Gusts about 45 plus miles per hour. Again, dangerous travel. Now, as we look at our evening and overnight hours, we'll see a cool evening around mid 40s overnight. Not too cold. At least we're not in the 30s. So that's some good news. Clouds increase. And then as we get into the morning hours here, you are starting to see us right around 50 degrees or so. So again, not the coldest storm system, which is some good news, but the rain does start picking up around 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. with those strong wind gusts around 11. Highs tomorrow in those mid to low 50s in the valley, 44 degrees in the foothills, that mix of rain and snow with about 27 degrees in the Sierra. Alex. All right, Carly, thank you. After the break, we're rounding up today's headlines and the local tribute just held for Sacramento native Tyree Nichols. Talking Points is after the break. All right, here are some stories that people are talking about today. Community members gathered tonight to remember Tyree Nichols, the Sacramento native who was beaten to death by Memphis police. People gathered around the state capitol this afternoon to release black and red balloons in honor of Tyree. Plans are also in the works to name a local skate park after him, and the hope is to have that done by June. 53-year-old Marion Wilkinson, a homeless advocate who went missing back in January, was found in Feather River Wednesday night. A fisherman made the discovery, and her cause of death is now under investigation. And federal regulators are now allowing Diablo Canyon, California's last nuclear power plant, to continue operations past 2025. And this gives more time for PG&E to apply for an additional 20 years of service. The plant provides 10% of the state's electricity. What reparations could look like for families in Sacramento? That story is after the break. California's first in the nation statewide reparations task force is meeting today and tomorrow in downtown Sacramento. And members are working on recommendations for state lawmakers on what form reparations should take in the state of California. And the goal is to help make amends for the generations of harm to African Americans caused by slavery and its longstanding effects in society. Becca Hobbegger brings us the conversation from today. Capital, money, reparations. That will stimulate this economy for the 2.6 million blacks in California. Dozens of people lined up to speak at day one of the California Reparations Task Force's March meeting held this month in Sacramento. They offered various perspectives on how reparations should look for black Californians. You can never repay for the damage have been done to black people in America. So I want to be very clear, land, land, land. Healthy land. Healthy land, not toxic land. The white farmers all around him had wells. We didn't. Gloria Puro Dyer came from Roseville to share her family's story. Growing up in Allensworth was an extraordinary experience uh, in terms of being able to see how racism affected an entire town. 
She grew up in the historically black Central Valley community of Allensworth, named for its founder, Colonel Allen Allensworth, a community built by and for black people. It thrived in the early 1900s, but dwindled in subsequent decades with a loss of water rights and many leaving for World War II. At the time, in the 1950s, uh, it was pretty much an all-black town. We had a 63-acre farm. And we didn't have wells, but the white farmers around us, they all had wells. This one white farmer who was across the road, he had his well, he would water his fields, and you know, water would run into the ditch. If he saw us let bring our cows out to drink water out of the ditch, he would tell us to get them over, back away from water in the ditch. That is hatred. I didn't experience the brunt of racism like I would have maybe if I had lived in Mississippi or someplace else, but I saw enough of it to realize the damage that could be Dead. She says growing up, her parents told her about her enslaved ancestors. They were treated like animals, only worse. She says chattel slavery has done generations of damage. That's why she's advocating for reparations, not only in the form of land and money, but also mental health resources. There are many who still have not been able to reach anywhere near their potential because of the psychological harm. And so even if money, for example, is put in somebody's hands, but if the internal uh, issues have not been resolved and healed, that person will go right on doing some pathological thing, possibly. Much of this goes back to the legacy of slavery and the psychological harm that was done to African Americans individually and as families. Some commenters called in, two people raising objections to the whole effort. I don't believe a single person deserves restitution in any form unless they are a Native American. Why is the state of California even doing this? This should be a federal thing, just like they did with the Japanese internment. But most people here and on the phone came with suggestions for reducing the harmful and lasting impacts of chattel slavery on African Americans. And Becca's with us right now. Becca, what is next? I mean, what do reparations look like and then who will be eligible? Yeah, you know, at their January meeting, task force members agreed to recommend that the state of California create something called the California African American Freedmen Affairs Agency to implement their recommendations and process claims. Now, those recommendations, those are due to the legislature in a final report this summer. Now, as for who would be eligible, the task force voted last year that black Californians who descended from enslaved Africans or from a free black person living in the U.S. prior to the end end of the 1800s would be eligible for monetary reparations. And the meeting wasn't just today, it does continue to tomorrow, right? Yeah, absolutely. A public comment begins at 9 a.m. at the Cal EPA building on I Street in downtown Sacramento. Anybody is welcome to attend and to participate in that public comment. All right, Becca, thank you. Let's get things over to Carly, get a check of our weather here. Carly, how's the weekend looking? <laughs> Yeah, the weekend is looking a, a little bit stormy. As we take a look here at our satellite radar, you can actually see the jet stream moving as a zonal flow straight into California right now. And that's what we're seeing when it comes to all the cloud coverage headed our way. But just north is that low pressure just waiting to dip down, bring in a lot of that moisture, but also some cold air. Luckily for us, not quite as cold in the valley as we've been feeling for the last week with those temperatures and those highs in those mid to upper 40s now. We're actually seeing some more of those highs in the mid to low 50s. So a little bit of an improvement there. We'll still see a cold enough air to at least turn that rain to snowfall, even at lower elevations through uh, Saturday into Sunday and early Monday morning. We do have a winter storm warning in effect till 10 a.m. on Monday. Impacts here uh, really snow down to even 1,000 feet. Now, we could even see 500 feet in elevation early Monday morning, but that would be the lightest dusting and Pretty much doesn't stick at that point. Gusts 45 miles per hour, so dangerous travel conditions Saturday and Sunday with the biggest impacts. Strong wind gusts 15 to 25 miles per hour, and we are going to expect to see a lot of those strong wind gusts for the high Sierra as well, up to again 45, maybe even 55 miles per hour for the high Sierra spots. Some gusts at the peaks there and ridges. Sunday at 1 a.m., so the overnight hour Saturday to Sunday morning is where we're going to also see the next pickup with more of those strong winds, but also that rain accompanying that in the valley with snow in the Sierra. By Monday, things do start to slow down. Let's take a look at the future cast radar. The clouds roll in through the weekend. By Saturday morning, we're looking at the first drops maybe around 9, 10 a.m., but by 11, really seeing that heavy downpour, that first band of rain and then snow showers. Finally, we get a small break. You'll actually maybe even see some sunshine Saturday afternoon, but that's not going to last long. We could see some thunderstorm chances. And then another line there by 1 a.m. on Sunday with heavy snow 
pushing at low elevations as well. More thunderstorm chances on Sunday afternoon. And then Monday, the impact drops down a little bit more. Let's talk about the uh, snowfall totals here. The GFS model is showing up to about anywhere from about 50, 55 inches possibly for the high Sierra spots. And then the European model showing something very similar, maybe off by just a couple of inches here, but still right around the 50s. So we're expecting to see a lot of snow off 80, even off Highway 4, 47 inches at Bear Valley, 24 inches Arnold, 19 inches Twain Heart. So yeah, a lot of snow still headed our way over the next four days. And we'll see anywhere from about a half inch to an inch of rain in the valley. Let's talk about the 10 day forecast. Well, that's going to bring us rain pretty much for the next four days, but we will see a, maybe a peak of sunshine in and out. That's also going to provide us some thunderstorm chances. Wednesday, Thursday, a little bit of sunshine, and then the following week. And unfortunately, <laughs> looks like we're going to see a little bit more rain on the way. It's Friday, so you already know we're hitting the back roads. And this week, John Bartel takes us to Salinas to learn more about California's most influential writer, John Steinbeck. Few California-born writers have as many of their books turned into movies as John Steinbeck has. East of Eden, Of Mice and Men, Red Pony, Wayward Bus was a film, Cannery Row was a film. I need more fingers to count on. Winter of Our Discontent, so like 14 or 15 films? So over a dozen films. Over a dozen films. The topics in his books were complex and heavy, but Hollywood screenwriters fell in love with Steinbeck's relatable characters. Live off the fat of the land. Keep looking for us. Characters like Lenny Small and George Milton in the story of Mice and Men. Characters who were based on real life Californians and the historical issues in Steinbeck's time. That's one thing he said is, I'm trying to write history as it happens and I have to get it right. Steinbeck grew up in Monterey County in the early 1900s and it was the backdrop for a number of his books. And you can experience his life at the National Steinbeck Center in his hometown of Salinas. So I feel like a lot of what he contributed was to see California as a place where literature happens. If you take a tour with archivist Lisa Josephs, you'll learn how historical events inspired more than 30 of his books. I don't understand it, though. Me neither, Ma, but... Hardships during the Great Depression inspired some of Steinbeck's most read books, including Grapes of Wrath, which won him a literary Nobel Prize for his realistic portrayal of Okies and the migrant workers he encountered during the Dust Bowl. In 1962, that uh, his wife had just turned on the news uh, one day, and they're just sitting there. I was like, oh, surprise. Nate, you sit here reading. After spending time as a correspondent in World War II, Steinbeck was asked by soldiers to write a comedy to boost the spirits of the nation. He did just that in the book Cannery Row, a heartwarming story of the camaraderie between fun-loving drunks who threw a disastrous party for their friend. People as needing one another. So throughout his books, you'll see people in relation that they can't live without one another. I'll keep it for you. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up and we'll, we'll just keep it in here. And then we'll, I'll yeah, never yeah. take it. Steinbeck goes Son. back in time in his book, East of Eden, and tells a story based on his own family living in the Salinas Valley through the beginning of the 20th century and World War I. Actor James Dean actually was nominated for an Academy Award for his performance in the book's film adaptation. But I am impelled not to squeak like a grateful and apologetic mouse, but to roar like a lion out of pride in my profession. <laughs> and in the great and good men who have practiced it through the ages. Steinbeck redefined American literature in his time. Growing up in California helped shape his writing, and because of that, his work is still read by students today. Literature is as old as speech. It grew out of human need for it, and it has not changed except to become more needed. From the National Steinbeck Center in Salinas, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. And you can find all of John's adventures at abc10.com slash backroads, or you already know you can text us at 916-321-3310, and we'll help you plan your next road trip. We're back after the break. California's COVID-19 state of emergency is over, but the effects of the virus are still lingering for a lot of people, and that's what we're working on for next week. We spoke with a man who is suffering from a long COVID. It's been three years after getting diagnosed. You know, I'm alive. 
but there isn't much of me behind there. That's been the one thing that's been really hard. Not being able to live while still being alive. <laughs> And we'll have Justin's story and a lot of other stories next week right here on To The Point. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at tothepoint at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.